Assalamualaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. In our last episode, we were having our discussion with Imam Muhammad Al Asi, who is the Mufassir of the Noble Quran titled The Ascendant Quran Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Twelve volumes of this monumental tafsir have already been published. Two more volumes are almost ready to go to press. And each volume is priced at $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. And they can be ordered from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0. Uh, Brother Muhammad, welcome to the program. It's nice and it's a pleasure to be on the program once again. Now, Brother Muhammad, in our last episode, uh, I had to stop you at the point where you were uh, discussing uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, it used to be a family-ruled kingdom, and today it is uh, a two-man rule. In fact, it's a one-man rule with the crown prince, uh, Muhammad bin Salman, uh, effectively in charge of everything. The question that I'd like to pose to you is, is Saudi influence in the Muslim world positive or negative? No, it's negative. I give you a very straight and, and uh, uh, blunt answer to that. It is very destructive not only negative, it is very destructive. Uh, the, the Saudi uh, rulers have been instruments uh, in promoting uh, imperialist and Zionist policies in the region and in the world. Uh, they financed many wars around the world, directly or indirectly. They've played with the petroleum issue so that uh, it does not disturb um, certain economies that have to be disturbed because of war policies. Uh, it takes its orders very obvi obviously from the United States and the Zionists. Right now, it, in the, it, within the internal house of Islam, it is trying to turn the Islamic attitude around. Uh, all the Muslims agree that uh, Palestine has to be free from Zionist colonization. It's tr the Saudi mouthpieces are trying to tell the Muslims of the world that the Zionists are not the enemy. Islamic Iran is the enemy. And they are doing all within their capacity re in the region, in the Arabian Peninsula. And they do have, you know, some of those nation states there that agree with them 100%. Uh, even the United Arab Emirates may be more zealous than, than the Saudis in combating Islamic self-determination and therefore in, in um, accepting any orders that come their way from Tel Aviv and Washington to take hostile positions towards Islamic Iran in, in the first instance. And now uh, more and more Turkey. Uh, it should be recalled that uh, there are reports that the, the uh, Arabian Peninsula wealthy class are withdrawing uh, many of their assets from Turkey. Is this coincidental? Why are these Arabian filthy rich princes, why are they at, at this time when the Turkish economy, as well as the economy in the Islamic Republic of Iran, but uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has immunized itself in certain ways in these past years, something that the Turks have not done. So the Turks are more vulnerable at this point than their neighbor in Iran is. But there's an economic warfare, and this comes from the uh, statements of the president of Turkey. There's an economic war now waged against Turkey by the United States and some other uh, Western interests. Why are these Arabian uh, people who are so rich and in the previous years have put some of their assets in Turkey, why are they interested right now in these peculiar circumstances of withdrawing those assets at a time like this in Turkey? These are, these are out and out enemies of the Muslims even though they cloak themselves with Islamic imagery. They should not be in, in uh, uh, administering Mecca and Al Medina, they should not be considered by any Muslim in the world to have any credibility when it comes to uh, Islamic issues. Now, Saudi Arabia calls itself a monarchy and there is a king. 
Are monarchy and kingship uh, permissible in Islam? No, absolutely not. These, I, I wish the Muslims were very keen and aware of their own history. It's true, the Saudi uh, rulers have an official name, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, KSA. Uh, but in, if we understood our Islamic history, this would be the kingdom of Umayyad Arabia in the 21st century in the Gregorian calendar, the 15th century in the Hijri calendar. This is our new and our uh, updated Umayyad ruling class. Unfortunately, because there's a discrepancy in the public Muslim mind, they can't bring the lessons of their history into their current affairs, and then they cannot relate their current affairs with the developments within their Islamic history. Someone, someone comes and says, oh, we have an Umayyad ruling class in Arabia. It throws a lot of wrenches in the you know, average traditional mind. But that's exactly what we have. The king of Saudi Arabia now is the same king that existed when power was usurped from the Muslim shura populist ruling model that the Prophet of Allah and his four successors left us with. That's what we have. The Saudis launched uh, a war on Yemen in March of 2015, and it's still raging. Why did they attack Yemen? Well, you know, it's, there's uh, a saying in the Arab uh, context. There was a, a hero, uh, a Hercules, an, a, an Arabian Hercules, in the times of Jahiliya. So one person asked him, how do you, how did you gain this um, notoriety? How did you become this uh, epic character in, in, uh, in Arab, Arabian society? He gave an answer that will, that will define why the Saudis are doing today. He said, whenever I enter into a battle. I'm going to skip the details of how those battles were fought. Whenever I enter into a battle, I would go for the weakest person, the person who appears to be very vulnerable, very um, doesn't have much arms, doesn't have much strength, and I strike him in a way that will cause the others who are on his side to be afraid of confronting me. So he picks on the smallest and most vulnerable and the weakest in, in the confrontation line so that the others are afraid. That's what Saudi Arabia did with Yemen. They figured that we will go and we will make a case out of Yemen, we'll pulverize Yemen so that our next moves, they were planning on other moves. Just like the US when it went into Afghanistan, Iraq, was planning on moving into other countries. When Saudi Arabia went into Yemen, they also had plans prepared for them to go into other countries. But it did not happen the way the Saudis and their masters had envisioned the results. They got caught in a quagmire. Saudi Arabia, uh, Yemen has become the Vietnam of the Saudis. They, they, they got involved in, in Yemen, now they don't know how to get out of it. And the poor, it's true, the Yemeni population is a poor population in the material sense, but it is a rich population when it comes to standing their grounds, fighting for their rights, and uh, repelling uh, aggression and enemies. And the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the rest, they, they had a coalition. That coalition has virtually withered away. The only ones left, basically, are the Saudi and the Emirati. And the Emiratis have also brought in many mercenaries from around the world to fight inside of Yemen. And that war has gone sour. And they don't know how to extricate themselves from it now. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman has opened too many fronts, both uh, internally as well as externally. 
he has taken on Iran, Qatar, he's attacking Yemen, etc. And internally, he has taken on the religious establishment as well as his cousins, etc., etc. What does it tell us about his mental state of affairs and his policies? In the first instance, it tells us that he is taking orders. He, he, he does what he is told. And the people who give him orders, the officials who give him orders, are basically in Tel Aviv and in Washington. Both of these capitals are working hand in hand to coach and to direct uh, Mohammed bin Salman to do what he is doing. And it has been a disaster in these two or three years since he's been doing what he's doing. And it's going to be more of a disaster in the coming years. All of these policies that the Saudis have got themselves entangled in have shown no positive results in any direction you approach it. Whether it's the military results, nothing. Or economic results, nothing. To the opposite, they've been, they've been gaining minuses from the wars uh, and the entanglements that they, they've been in, in Libya in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, uh, even inside Saudi Arabia itself. The, they used to have a religious establishment. The history was the religious establishment and the political establishment, they got into a marriage. And it was more than a, a, a political uh, marriage. It was literally family to family marriage. The family of Saud and the family of Shaykh Al Saud, they, they call themselves Al Saud and Al Sheikh. They intermarried, so there, there was it, it, it was it was more than uh, um, a signing paper relationship. It was a blood relationship. That blood relationship has come undone because of uh, Muhammad ibn Salman. He's antagonized his own religious base. Now he has hundreds of religious scholars behind bars. He's also antagonized his own extended family, his Saud tribe. Many of them are against him because he has monopolized this power, relying on uh, imperialist America and Zionist Israel. So this is, this is going to blow up. This is going to blow up in his face. And he doesn't know. He can't calculate. They want to build this new city called Neom on the borders of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And this is going to wind, wind up as a, also a big disaster. They, they want to build this city, which is going to occupy around 28,000 square kilometers. Imagine one city, 28,000 square kilometers. What's the budget for building that city? $500 billion. A half a trillion dollars to build the most modern, the most industrialized, the most sophisticated city on planet Earth. Now, this is what the mainstream media tells you. It's a project uh, incorporating these three countries, Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Well, just take a look at the map, please. Go to the map and see this corner, and you will find there's Elat there. That's the major port of the Zionists. So the Zionists are lurking behind this project to milk them through the fancy propaganda. They say, oh, we're going to absorb the Palestinians because the Palestinians are, are a very a professional class of people. Generally speaking, the Palestinian population is a professional class of people. So he said, oh, is gonna, we, we, this Palestinian problem, they want the right to return? Uh, we'll give them jobs. We'll give them citizenship in the countries that they are living in. We'll, uh, we'll make the future bright for them. And then the Palestinian, this is part of what is called the deal of the century. And then the Palestinian, what is called the right of return, and the Palestinian, Palestinian issue will be solved, and all of it's going to be, they think, courtesy of these uh, pre-arranged uh, plans, which uh, are going to spell out the doom of the Saudi kingdom. Watch and see. You mentioned that Mohammed bin Salman has um, arrested hundreds of uh, religious scholars. Uh, there are, in fact, believed to be tens of thousands of political prisoners in Saudi Arabia. Now, if Mohammed bin Salman is in charge of things, 
uh, and in total control, what's he so afraid of that he's imprisoning so many people? Well, it knows that, uh, you know, the instinct of survival is very, uh, is very strong in everyone. Uh, in, in the, these, uh, this ruling family there included. And they figured that they are, this is a gamble. They're taking a very big risk. Uh, they know, before anyone else, the depth of the uh, feelings of the Muslims all around the world, in, include in their own kingdom, against the uh, Israeli Zionist colonization of Palestine and the Holy Land. They know that very well. So in order for them to try to get away with what they are doing, they had to take these um, preemptive measures uh, to survive what they are doing. If these people were left to speak their conscience, uh, then there would be, for the first time, internal opposition to the ruling class in uh, what is called the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They don't want anything like that to happen, so put them behind bars. No one will, will hear them. They will be there. And some of them are suffering. I mean, these are their, um, these are their celebrity scholars. We're not just talking about, you know, marginal figures. These were the ones who in the past 30 years were up front uh, giving uh, credibility and uh, popularity, in some cases, to the ruling class in Saudi Arabia. All of these now, or 90 plus percent of them, are behind bars. Uh, which goes to tell you that um, uh, they're setting themselves up for an, an in, this could turn out to be an internal civil war in Saudi Arabia if things continue like this. Where do you think the greatest opposition would come from? The greatest opposition is going to come from, uh, actually it's going to come from all over. It's going to come from this very strict religious class right now that has, has been put behind bars. It's going to come from the, um, the westernized uh, types of uh, individuals, uh, basically those who uh, gained their higher education in Europe and the United States and Western countries, who have been to a certain de degree secularized. They are secular. And they can see through the shenanigans of these current measures that are taken by the Saudi rulers. They're going to be in opposition. The women in Saudi Arabia have come under you know, certain types of harassment and pressure. There are women who are calling for you know, equal uh, civic standing with men in society, which is Islamic. Some of them are doing it from an Islamic background. Some of them are just doing it just because it's common sense. So opposition is going to come from them. There's also an expatriate class of people in Saudi Arabia. There's about 10 million of them now. They're, of course, it's hemorrhaging. Many of them under duress, the type of policies and regulations that the Saudis have enforced upon them, they're forcing many of them to leave the kingdom. But there's still around 10 million of them inside the country. And around between 1 and 2 million of them are Yemenis or of Yemeni origin. So they have pains and aches in their psychology and in their lives. And uh, there's also the uh, Islamic uh, movement types inside Saudi Arabia. Islamic movement, they, they're not, they don't belong to that religious uh, Salafi Wahhabi hierarchy uh, of different shades, Muslims. All of these are going to, co are going to find a common purpose in opposing the Saudis. The only thing that's needed is organization and leadership. And they would decapitate any uh, potential leader or any potential organized Islamic effort to, to have this gel together and erupt in uh, a serious opposition against uh, the ruling family that has sold out to imperialism and Zionism, the Zionist Saudis. Given all this, do you see the Saudi regime surviving for another 10 years?
Oh no, oh God forbid, no, la samahallah, no. I, they'd be lucky if they survive another five years. At the pace that things are developing now, they would be very lucky if they survive five years. I would, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, Trump said it, if it wasn't for, I'm paraphrasing, the President of the United States said when the French President was visiting, he said that these rulers who are immensely rich, these are his words, they are immensely rich. They would not survive for one week if it wasn't for us. And then he turned to the French President and he said, and I know you, you, you're part of this too, you, 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 you know, but we support them and that's why they survive. So imagine if they decide for they meaning Washington decides for practical reasons that the Saudis are no longer um, uh, worth it. Now uh, uh, here's where another uh, uh, another dimension to the whole issue is. You think that the people in Washington DC cannot figure out that the Saudis are uh, digging their own grave and if they are going to go down into this grave don't you think that they would think of who the who should replace them? I'm sure there's plan A and plan B and C for the replacement of this expiring uh, kingdom. It could come from the military. It could come from fake Islamic types. Or it could come from outside. I don't know. I mean... Uh, a troubling aspect of Bani Saud rule over the Arabian Peninsula is that the two holy cities of Mecca and Medina are also located there. And uh, unfortunately, many Muslims in their innocence uh, think that because of the sanctity of these two places, that somehow this sanctity um, also transfers to the ruling family. Now, are there any moves uh, in the Muslim world to divest this family from control of the two holy cities of Mecca and al Madina that are called the Haraman? I wish there was. Uh, there's beginning to be uh, scholars who are thinking in that direction. For the first time, uh, with high decibel, we begin to hear like the scholars in Tunisia, they, they told the Tunisian Muslims, don't go to Hajj this year. Um, there's been in previous years, I remember way back in the 1990s, that was a pioneering effort by the late Dr. Karim Siddiqui when he had uh, a conference there that called on the administration of Mecca and al Medina uh, to be in the hands of maybe a committee of uh, qualified and professional Islamic scholars and Islamic administrators who would take this, these two areas out of Saudi control. Uh, but the Saudi government is antagonizing populations. If, it's, if it disagrees with a certain uh, government, it tells the population of that uh, country, you cannot come to Hajj. I mean, the Syrians cannot go to Hajj. The Yemenis cannot go to Hajj. I mean, there are probably some of them can find sneaking avenues to get in. But in the normal channel of things, they can't go to Hajj. Uh, and so I, I, the, the, the movement towards resting the control of Mecca and al Medina and maybe the whole of al Hijaz from this uh, wicked uh, ruling class, uh, that momentum is beginning to increase year after year. And inshallah, in the, in the coming years, we will see a Mecca and al Medina that's no longer controlled. Uh, by those who are controlled by the Zionists and imperialists. Now, just to clarify, the Saudis impose um, fees for visas for Umrah and Hajj, as well as uh, make other charges of uh, pilgrims. Is there any justification for such fees in the Noble Quran or in the prophetic Sunnah? Absolutely not. There's. The, the Saudis are interfering in an Islamic obligation uh, that has no intermediary. The, the, when, you, when Muslims go to pray, we don't need permission to pray. 
Does anyone need permission to perform their salah? When we, when we fast during Ramadan, does it, do we take permission from anyone to fast during Ramadan? When we pay our zakah, do we take permission from anyone to pay our zakah? When we say our shahada, do we take permission from anyone to say our shahada? So, a shahada, a salah, a sawm, a zakah, the, these are four, the four foundations from among the five. The fifth is the hajj. Why, why is it that when some Muslim wants to perform his or her hajj duty now, we need some type of permission? In this case, it's called a visa. Or there's some other type of impositions in, uh, along this. There's some other fees you have to pay. Who said? Who said I have to pay other fees uh, to a certain government to perform the hajj? Where did this come from? Only thing, you know, I'm responsible for is my physical uh, capacity, capability. If I have physical capability, alhamdulillah, I can go. And then if I have the financial uh, wherewithal to cover the expenses of traveling to the hajj. Yeah, yeah okay, uh, we do that. Just like if you have to go to salah, okay, you have to ride in a car to go to the masjid. Okay, but is there, between your home and going to the masjid, is there some roadblock there telling you you need permission to go forward to that masjid? There's no such thing. Why, why do we have this in, when we want to uh, discharge our hajj obligation? What, where is that? Where did that come from? And these Saudis, they speak about, you know, there shouldn't be any intercession. Your relationship is directly, okay, <laughs> here we are. If you're true to your words, why are you interceding in this uh, basic foundation of the Islamic faith? Why, why are you there interfering with our relationship with Allah? There's no basis for that. They can't quote one ayah. They cannot quote one hadith to explain away their imposition of this official permission called a visa or the economic uh, charges that they have tagged on to going to the Hajj. Where did that come from? And these, uh, these fees that they are collecting, if there's two million people going to Hajj, and I, I, I believe in North America, there's at least in the United States, uh, there's a $350 charge that goes to the Saudi government. Where, why, 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 who said? The Saudi government is killing innocent people. If I'm paying that government $350, I'm violating my Hajj. I'm participating in war crimes. I should not be doing that. But you need, you need knowledge, you need information, you need maturity so that you know, once this becomes public knowledge and all the Muslims know about this, then the Saudi government cannot get away with these types of things. Brother Muhammad, I'm afraid we are out of time. We'll have to stop there, but inshallah we'll continue our discussion in our next episode. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. You've been watching Muslim Perspectives. I'm Zafar Bangash from me and my crew here at Muslim Perspectives. Thank you very much for watching. We look forward to seeing you again at the same channel, same time next week. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuhu.